And Piedi, a European Commission, Head of Unit uh, DG Research and Innovation. Thank you. Where should I sit? Yeah, of course. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And then Francesco Lecis, EY Industrial Product Consulting Leader. Francesco. And then Hans Krattenmacher, so Eurodrive, Chief Technical Officer, Mechatronics. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Hello. Well, let's remind the phone number for the question. We want this to be an interactive discussion, so please feel free to send your question to plus 393477467130. Okay, so we can start. Thank you for being here. And well, I want to start with uh, Jürgen Piedie. Let's start from the 22 World uh, Manufacturing Report. Uh, what are the key takeaways uh, from your point of view? First of all, let me say I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> We are really back after COVID-19, and it's good to see you, Marco, and so many other people here. Uh, Europe has already been mentioned several times this morning. Um, I think it's an excellent report, and it's a bit looking forward, and we should use this report also for European discussions. We have a partnership made in Europe. We have EIT manufacturing, and I can only invite Marco to bring this, this report into those discussions. Um, I was looking into the redesign goals, I liked them a lot. If you would like to apply the sixth one, and I was uh, uh, cognitive manufacturing, circular manufacturing, global risk resilient manufacturing, hyper personalized manufacturing, rapidly responsive manufacturing, inclusive manufacturing. If I take the perspective of a small and medium sized company who is not in the world of industry 4.0 and is late in digitization, good luck. That's a tough one. But maybe I think it's the right way forward. Uh, and I would say, the, if you, since we are here all admiring the Porsches and you are a driver, uh, cognitive manufacturing, you drive. Circular manufacturing, if you don't want to drive, the Green Deal will drive you. And the circular economy will actually become a reality in terms of technology. It's no longer a buzzword. It's getting very serious, in my view, in particular when it comes to data management. Hyper-personalized manufacturing, customized manufacturing, I just was listening to the previous speakers. <coughs> you will face products which should be designed for the individual needs of a customer. So this will be the driving forces. What has changed is, I think if I look at the other ones, that you can no longer say, you look a bit, you want to drive fast and you look at the rear window. No, when you shift the gear, you have to look at global risks and you have to look that you have the workforces inclusive keeping them. So that's actually the message I see coming out of it. I felt that this debate about globalization or deglobalization, the world has changed. So I think what we should really do when it comes to the debate on the globalization to build on what we have learned. And um, so I'm not a less of this fan now we deglobalize. I learned this nice term globalization. <laughs> I need to digest this. I think what uh, small and medium sized companies will face and that, I'm pretty sure, will be a huge diversification of the supply chains. And if you are a small and medium-sized companies and you're not digitized, you're not using digital twins, that's going to be very tough because we need to work, for instance, on digital twins, on value chains, servitization. So the world starts moving faster. Uh, therefore, I do not believe that we can say it's either or. The globalization will look differently. Yes, you will have more regional markets because there maybe the supply and risk are better managed. But I would not speak about deglobalization. I think that's, that's the wrong approach. We have big European players and they remain global. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we will go back to globalization. But in the meantime, Hans Krattenmacher, well, manufacturing is adopting a new approach to supply chains, yeah. basically from cost optimization to risk minimization. Well, I want to know what are the consequences in your view? Uh, so first of all, always thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, um, I think the last decade, maybe the last two decades, we had been all wrapped in, in a kind of cotton. We just said, okay, globalization means that I can look for the uh, best processes, best suppliers the, um, in, in terms of cost optimization um, as well as quality. Um, 
and we had been looking on quality and then cost, um, and we'd been looking for first and second tier supplier, but we didn't care about what happened if there is suddenly a, lim a limitation. And I think this will be changed dramatically in the future. That's what we're doing in our company. We say, okay, maybe we have to move over from cost optimization and process optimization to risk optimization, because at the end, if you can't you know, supply your customer at all, this is the, the largest threat. And what we have learned the last 18 months is, or 24 months is, um, that we all underestimated limitations in terms of, of logistics, in terms of, of um, a war, in terms of pandemic. If you suddenly are not able to supply your customers because you are not supplied by, by um, your suppliers. And, um, and at the end now, the consequence is how to organize in the future. Can we believe that we go back to the kind of globalization as we had it before? Um, maybe. At the end, nobody knows. Nobody knows um, what will happen in, in the next decades. Um, and this means you have to move over to a pure risk-oriented supply chain management. That's it. And that's what we are doing. We said, OK, we look on our suppliers, where, they're where they are located. We're looking more our customers, where they are located, and we, we try to organize in a way that we produce local for local. I'll give you an example. We are strong in China, in Europe, as well in America. And um, we had the great luck that, for other reasons, we are, we are organized in the way that we are very local. So we produce local for local. And this was for the reason because we wanted to be close to our customers. But we didn't have done this for our supply chains. And this is what we want to change in the future. We said, okay, we also want to organize our supply chains. We're looking for, first of all, where are raw materials available? Then what, what about the procurement market? What is the first and second tier supplier? Then how can we produce it? And then going to the customer and then to the end customer. And this we want to, analyze, uh, to, to um, implement in that way for Asia, for Europe, and for America. This means that we have to reshore some of our abilities to Europe, but also vice versa. We have to install some abilities in China as well as in, in America. So that at the end, that the risk is, is a little bit lower, pretty much lower as, as today, and uh, that if one region is struggling, that we can compensate it with the other uh, region. The challenge is to keep the quality in all regions on the same level, uh, to organize the supply chains in, on the same level, and to, to keep the technology, the product, the behavior of the product on the same level if you produce them in China or in America or in Europe. Um, but for me personally, I think there is no other way uh, believing that you can do something in a centric way and then distributing it all over the way or to get components or raw material uh, from, from a center point in the world. We have heard raw materials um, um, are located mainly in China, for example, rare magnets for our electric motors. Um, I think this, this, you can't manage it anymore in that way. You have to distribute to uh, the risk over the world. We know in, in, in Technology, we have one rule if we have to lower risk. This is redundancy and diversity. And I think these two rules we also have to apply for our supply chains and for the organization of, of uh, FAP. If you're doing like that, globalization will still happen. That's for sure. Well, Francesco Lecis, uh, well, based also on what Hans said, do you see a new paradigm in manufacturing and how do you, how do you see supply chains changing also if your clients uh, are reshoring, are nearshoring, what's happening? Okay, well, thanks again also uh, for inviting me here. Uh, elaborating on your question, uh, I think that uh, I definitely agree with both of you uh, in the sense that uh, globalization definitely is not over because market is global and is global both for big companies and also for mid caps. In Italy, we have a lot of uh, uh, small and mid caps companies. And if I look to what um, uh, clients are asking us in terms of transformation project in the last couple of years, 
I think that this point of, uh, let's say, risk mitigation on the supply chain, meaning in um, reconfiguring the overall footprint of the companies, so also deciding which plants to keep uh, for produce and which suppliers to keep um, uh, to supply, is uh, somehow 90% of the operation assignment we are doing. On the other hand, um, I think that um, on um, adult companies or advantaged companies are not looking to this risk mitigation just in terms of defense, meaning that is the reconfiguration and the reshoring of the supply chain is not just I mitigate the risk of business continuity, but is also somehow I gain a competitive advantage in having shorter lead time and faster reaction time to the market, or I'm gaining competitive advantage in having a diversified a panel of possible supplier. In other words, uh, the companies that are ahead uh, are looking to this uh, reconfiguration of the footprint uh, in uh, creating a competitive advantage idea. And also for companies that have to serve a global market, uh, this is somehow as a cost, as a cost that has to be evaluated, and you need technologies in order to, uh, in order to do it or to, to manage it. But if I think, let's say, at an overall level, I am seeing, in particular, the Italian company, which are the one I'm following, that are somehow reconfiguring the supply chain with, in particular, nearshoring. So coming from um, long leg from Far East to maybe, let's say, medium leg in the Mediterranean basin. On the other hand, also looking to new logistic footprint to serve the market. So these are the two, let's say, main pillars uh, we, are looking at, we are looking at now. But I think that the key point uh, is uh, try to exploit uh, the occasion to rethink uh, to, the overall, um, to the overall footprint. Because this is something that, let's say, is creating already uh, advantages, in particular to all the companies in, 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 our, in our industrial uh, market that has also to reconfigure the product panel. Because if we think to all the tier one automotive companies, is something that is on the table uh, in terms of um, innovation and um, uh, changing uh, uh, the way that they're making, uh, they're making manufacturing. Well, I want to go back uh, to the big question with Jürgen Tiedi. So uh, you said globalization is not over. OK, but do you see supply chains become less global and also if you agree you said you mentioned also before if you agree with uh, what professor Teich said this morning so that we are in front of globalization thanks for the question it's it's not a big question for me i think it's a big question for many companies let's first of all and they might be best place to answer it what you clearly see I take an example, all batteries, Umicore, goes public and says, well, we want to be less global, we would like, in terms of managing our risk, focusing more what we can do in Europe. This, I think, is a credible choice. Because at the end, globalization was not done for the sake of having globalization. It's about reducing costs, have better quality. That's why we went for globalization. If we can get it better at a regional level, <coughs> do it. So Umicore is such an example. Uh, therefore, I think we cannot say there is a global trend towards deglobalization or globalization. I think what we have, of course, to see, and that maybe companies underestimate when it comes to supply chains in Europe, Critical Raw Materials Act. Europe announced next year there will be Critical Raw Materials Act. There, we will start talking about mining, stockpiling of critical raw materials. All of a sudden, you have actually strong public interventions because they see there's going to be a big issue. The same with the CHIPS Act. A strong public intervention to say we have to restore certain supply chains, we call it open strategic autonomy, also to be really on the safe side and not that actually later on we have not the semiconductors or chips or you have a local conflict somewhere in Asia and we don't understand why this is escalating here in Europe if you take the examples of chips. Mm -hmm. Well, Hans Grattenmacher, you are a, a B2B global player, so basically you have an overview of what's happening. And I want to know what is your approach, you mentioned also before, but also your client's approach in facing these many challenges. And how do, me, how do you minimize the risk, for example, with China? We are listening these days to the, to the news, basically is closing again because of COVID. So how to minimize the risk, the, the many risks that we are facing right now? Yeah, 
Good, good question. We, we uh, spoke several times in our company, what about decoupling, as it is also so named from, from China, or decoupling from US, or uh, for whatever country. I think, I also agree, globalization is not over. People want to trade, um, uh, because trading usually brings, is bringing people together. And so this will always happen. Um, but I think we have to accept that, that globalization will, will change his face uh, from time to time. It will be not always in the same manner. And now coming to your question, how to react on the behavior of our customers. So um, first of all, we, we always try to be very close to our customers. This, was, this is our basic philosophy. And now we recognize that in, in this new global world, this is the best, obviously, uh, the best approach to be more decentralized. We are highly decentralized. We have made simulation what would happen if we are, are not able to, to supply China from Europe anymore uh, in a direct way. And we recognize that, okay, we, we can isolate our Chinese subsidiary completely. They can do their business and we can do our business. Um, and this is what I really strongly can recommend to, to everybody to reduce the dependency between your subsidiaries. Uh, try to serve local by local. And if your customers are going locally to China, try them to serve them from China, from Europe, from Europe, from America to America. This is the most stable way to organize, um, at, at the end, uh, a, a FEP or uh, a company, because you, are, you reduce the dependencies. The more dependencies you have, uh, the more threatened you are, the more fragile is, is your system. Um, and in formal times, we have done this uh, for the supply chain in the direction of the customer, for the B2P uh, business. Now we're doing it also uh, in uh, the other direction, means for our supply. And um, I think this will be the, the future uh, for, for us. Uh, that's, trying to reduce dependencies. We don't know what kind of limits um, will popping up in the next couple of years. We had the Brexit. We thought, OK, Brexit will be easy going. Um, we already have spent more than 2 million euro only for qualification. We have wasted nothing. We haven't improved anything in our product. Only qualification, 2 million. There's the first barrier. We have these limitations um, in some Asian countries as well as in, in, in US. It's not only that we're talking about China. This means we have to accept that barriers can popping up. I absolutely agree. Nationalism is increasing, increasing all over the world. So we have to expect that we get suddenly limitations we didn't have to expect it in the past. And this means be agile. I also agree we have to, to think in a new way when we're designing our products. We just started with that, to do it in a modular way, that we can react on that. Um, it was a nice recommendation not to overreact, uh, but to be honest, the last eight months we only had to overreact because if you are three months out of production, you really overreact. But I agree, we have to come back, and at the end you have to make your designs in the way um, that you can replace even complicated parts of your products in an easy way. I would like to give you one example. We have made, in the meanwhile, for example, especially our electronic designs, in a so-called multiple design. So we have complicated components, which in former times you really would do only in one design for cost reasons. Now we make multiple designs, so if the one supplier is struggling, that we can move over to the other one. And the next step, what we're doing is, for example, I do not expect that we are allowed in the future to send all kinds of electronic components to China. So we try to identify potential Chinese suppliers providing similar semiconductors so that we are able to produce the same product with pure Chinese components for China and with European components for Europe. This will not become easy. Of course. Uh, this will become the challenge for the future to, to at the end, making the next step in globalization. The time where we can expect that everything is at any time in the amount you need available at the time you wanted to have, these times are definitely over, at least for the next decade. And um, so that's the reason why we are doing all this. 
Well, uh, Francesco, he shared uh, his experience uh, with the uh, examples. I want to listen to, I mean, uh, maybe if you have any interesting uh, case study to share with us. Oh, uh, yes. This one was really, was really interesting in the sense that uh, the idea of uh, delocalization of the know-how is somehow something that is really shortening uh, uh, the time and fastening, uh, let's say, the, the decision is something that uh, I'm seeing also in the market. Just to mention a couple of examples uh, of Italian clients, uh, uh, what, um, how they are reacting, let's say, to these, uh, uh, to these challenges. From one side, let's say, the idea of coming from the long leg to, from the Far East, uh, meaning uh, in particular, in the, I mentioned in the fashion industry, uh, for Bangladesh or for Vietnam or for China, Coming down to uh, North Africa, for example, is something that, so in, a, in an idea of nearshoring rather than, uh, rather than uh, reshoring, is somehow shortening the lead time. Obviously, you have to offset the increase of price or you have to offset, um, let's say, uh, also um, the decrease of the pot potential decrease of quality with some specific supplier development uh, activity that is uh, more or less the same of, let's say, transferring the technology. So giving the value added, let's say, to, to the supplier, find a way to develop in a very fast uh, way a diversified uh, panel of potential supplier. And this is something I'm mentioning a company that uh, maybe was uh, used uh, to work uh, in a traditional uh, uh, two-season uh, work, uh, while the market today is asking uh, you to have uh, seven, eight, uh, nine uh, collection uh, per year. And so how to deal with it uh, if you have uh, uh, four months uh, of uh, lead time uh, to your supplier in the Far East. Uh, that's why, let's say, the nearshoring created a competitive advantage. The challenge is, uh, let's say, to embed a, a vast panel of potential suppliers that today has not the capability or has not, let's say, the, the same quality uh, that is needed. So this enhancement of capabilities is, a, uh, is, a, uh, uh, is, a, is a somehow a competitive, uh, a competitive advantage. On the other end, the other idea that I'm mentioning is uh, uh, related, uh, let's say, to the um, uh, high-level high um, uh, and high-value-added uh, activities, uh, in particular of new products, uh, is another client I was mentioning before, the automotive, that somehow came down from uh, UK because of Brexit. Uh, so in order to shorten the lead time, uh, uh, Brexit uh, um, created um, some issue. And in the end, uh, wanted to create a new, totally new product for, uh, let's say, circular material in Italy, and this uh, somehow uh, created more than 50 uh, engineer uh, labor work um, uh, coming down from the, UK, uh, from the UK to Italy. So this can be, let's say, one in uh, the B2C and the other one in a B2B idea, a couple of examples of uh, uh, sh changing uh, uh, the supply chain uh, footprint. Well, let's move on on the role of policymakers, uh, Jurgen Thierry. I want to ask, uh, uh, obviously, what are the interventions the European Commission is implementing? And also, what role do research and innovation play in the European Commission policy? This is a big question for me now. <laughs> uh, since I stand for Horizon Europe, uh, I'm working quite actively in work programs called Digital Industry Space. Actually, the next one is going out now or on Monday. It's a package of 2.7 billion euros in terms of research funding offered to the industry. Uh, where we need to be strong and even stronger. First, we are working a lot with partnerships. We have a strong partnership called Made in Europe on manufacturing. Where we need also to be stronger is when it comes to the whole impact of research. So it's no longer talking about uh, a project has to show us there's an impact. No, the commission with the players have to organize impact via speed, scale, efficiency. We need to be faster. If you look, for instance, now not on manufacturing, but to energy intensive industries, these are massive investment cycles. They need to have all technologies ready by 2030 to be climate neutral by 2050. You cannot just indicate to the industry, do it or you take SMEs on manufacturing. There are massive amounts where we need to help. And Horizon Europe is a nice instrument, but we need to focus on synergies with other programs. Uh, for energy intensive industries, it's innovation funds. I think if it is for Horizon Europe, we have to reach out to regional funds, which is not so easy because the regions want to decide, but it's sometimes important to engage with us. We have smart specialization programs which can actually help 
Uh, and here, there are actually many concrete avenues what we can do. In terms of Horizon Europe, we are reaching now our midterm. So next year, we will have the so-called strategic plan, where I think in terms of the overall policy, we remain stable. But there's plenty of opportunities, in particular for industry, to come in and say, for the work programs 2025 to 2027, we need new priorities, different priorities. Uh, the one mentioned by Mark Teich, more resilience, uh, looking also at critical raw materials. Maybe one aspect, critical raw materials has a research component, because it's mentioned. And uh, there will be a legal act coming up by March. On the one hand, all of a sudden we start talking about, do we need mining in Europe? I have a research commissioner said, I need to talk about mining? This is not really the knowledge base of Europe. So we will also launch a discussion on advanced materials, and we need one. Yep. Materials with novel properties. That we will do and to be more strategic. But on the Critical Raw Materials Act, I think to reassure the people in March, we want to come out with very concrete measures to come a grip to it, because it's clear that you cannot leave to the supply chains of companies. So we really help what we can do within Europe, but also member states who need to engage much more with real governance on managing the supply chains for critical raw materials, rare earths, lithium, we know them. We are receiving a lot of questions for you in the meantime. Oh, okay. So <laughs> if you're okay. Well, first question, how to open up more research programs like Horizon Europe to Italian manufacturing, small, medium enterprises that are less and less successfully? I think first, if you're an SME, you need to find a good partner. Mm. Don't go on your own. Uh, second point, SMSNE, you need to go into partnerships because partnerships, we call them European partnerships like Might in Europe device a roadmap seven years long. So this gives actually an SME a quite a predictable agenda whether they want to engage, yes or no. The biggest challenge we of course face is that sometimes small and medium sized companies have a very short term view. I have an innovation, can I explain this in the afternoon? That I cannot deliver, but they need to connect to concrete tools offered by Europe, we take the digital innovation hubs, uh, and we need maybe also something for the Green Deal, which we currently don't have. Uh, but there are lots of publicly funded centers, digital innovation hubs, AI centers, and chips we will have in future competence centers. We have not enough, we will have an open innovation test beds on hydrogen. So we need much more technology infrastructures to support the SMEs, that, they, that we shorten their ways, actually, and they have not just said, oh, I need to apply for a call of 15 million euros and work with 50 other partners. This is too tough. So in some, go into the networks to see what's going on, and then look also for technology infrastructures in each member state which actually can help. That would be my very concrete advice. Well, another question, because uh, after that, we, I want to go with you about circular economy and the role that it can have. Uh, well, Europe has nearly lost the battle versus the US in digital, at least uh, B2C in EV innovation versus China for semiconductors and chips, rare earths, uh, EV batteries. Is a circular economy product uh, the last chance? Uh, how to face it? What do you think uh, on that? OK, thanks for the question. I, I wouldn't say that circular economy is the last chance. I'm a bit ironic now. We need just to move beyond the the bubble of circular economy. All of a sudden, it's getting very serious. And every company has to judge, do I actually organize a circular value chain because it actually is less risky than relying on a global value chain. You have heard about gigafactories for batteries. It's everywhere in the press. And there's a strong circular economy component on it. We'll have the same for chips. So circular economy is not the last chance, but it's something where actually people have to think across value chains so don't think about uh, recycling of textiles. No, which other value chains you can actually engage and turn circular economy in a real opportunity. And I think the other dimension which is missing on circular economy is the data spaces. And uh, because exchanging data, valorizing data, then really circular economy can take off. Mm. There I see, I see a big opportunity even. Not the last chance, a big opportunity. Well, Hans Kardenmacher, do you agree? Because I'm, I, maybe circular economy, uh, we need to consider it as a solution, not just for green transition, but also uh, as a remedy to reduce uh, raw materials needs. So what do you think on that? 
Um, I I 100% agree with that. Um, we've when when we have analyzed where are the raw materials, looking on Asia, they have all raw materials they need. Looking on America, they have all raw materials they need. Looking on Europe, empty pockets. We don't have the raw materials we need. So, moving into a circular economy uh, can be one solution to survive. We have a lot of raw materials installed in our in our fabs in form of all kind of goods. Why not to reduce these materials? This is these are really raw materials. We only have to change our attitude. Today, if we're talking about what is a new product, when we're talking about that the new product is, I've made it out of raw material. I've uh, made out of a raw material metal, out of this metal, a car, whatever. This is a new product. I think the new attitude we have really to go in is, a new product is when the estimated and predicted lifetime is fulfilled. If I reuse parts, or recycle parts, this doesn't matter, this is raw material. And we try to, to go in this circular economy. Um, for example, we've we uh, really successfully installed a process, a process where we can recycle the brakes for our gear motors, for our electric motors, in the way that we get the copper for recycling, but even more, that we get the housings, that we can reuse the housings. Um, and especially for Europe, I think it would be perfect way to do a better marketing for the circular economy, not in the way that it is green and sustainable and we love the environment. No, this is something to survive. Something to survive because we don't have the raw material in our earth. And, and uh, I strongly, strongly recommend to change a little bit the marketing. It's it, the same way with, with conversion of energy. Um, we, we always say, okay, we have to decarbonize for that, for that reason, we have to reduce uh, the, the, the amount of combustion engine, all like this, but what would be if we have a different look on that? If we can generate all the energy we need independent from materials and resources from outside, this is a benefit. And this is a large benefit. And I think we should have a look on the circular, uh, circular economy on the same way, so that it is not something crucial to, to make everybody happy and to save the environment, no, but also to survive because these are all raw materials. There's a tremendous work to do, for sure, because this means that the product has to come back to you. Um, by the way, we already have the law for it. This is the law for, for circular economy, uh, even today, we are officially only allowed to create products according to the circular economy. But if I would ask all my colleagues responsible for R&D, have you designed your product in that way? I am not 100% sure what the answer will be. I only can encourage it, just do it, go that way. We want to go that way. It, is, it will become a way full of barriers, for sure. But once again, I think it is the only way that we really use our resources in the proper way, especially in Europe, because we don't have the raw materials. Jürgen Tiede, do you want to add something? I saw you saying yes. <laughs> I think so. I think if you have to make long-term investments, okay, now a little bit um, very personal remark, we have many national ra rates on national percentages as regards renewable energy. Yeah. What about national recycling rates for critical raw materials. That would be a message. And I'm pretty sure the markets will start adapting. And all of a sudden, you will have a big move in the recycling. This is a bit off the cuff. This is a very personal remark. Eh? Don't know whether it's going to come. But I think that would be something where we can really do a lot. And I think also big companies, let's take a chemical industry, chemical industry a big chemical plant that can organize so much circularity around this plant you cannot imagine, like a steel plant as well. They could organize quite a lot. We have plenty of opportunities. And there's also one way actually for ensuring one thing. This is to keep the companies on your territory, that they're not moving away to Asia. It's a different way of organizing things here. But in my view, it's worth for really investment. Not only business models, also technologies. It's a big digital agenda which is actually out. Francesco Lecci, so what's your opinion on that? I, I, I was just... Uh, to, to add one point uh, in the sense that 
I do think that the challenge of the circular economy somehow is exactly, is not a challenge in terms of will to do, it's a challenge in terms of technology, because somehow it is there where we can, let's say, win the battle. Meaning that, just to make an example of the chemical products, uh, start, we are front runners uh, in uh, uh, special polymers, uh, high pressure, resilient, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's not just a matter of, let's say, creating uh, a circular process is a matter of inventing new products. So we are at the edge of disruption in uh, inventing new materials and new technology. So it's there where we can play our role, and it's there, I think, where we can, uh, where we can uh, win. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that this is a battle that, that, we, can, that we can work. And then looking again, not in defense, but in attack, uh, is where we can, we can create a competitive advantage uh, um, with the rest of the world. So somehow, we can redesign uh, keeping uh, our intellectual property here. And also, in this challenging environment, uh, what are your expectations for policymakers? <laughs> I, I will steal <laughs> something that you just said, because uh, uh, I think that uh, from a, a policymaker point of view, in this era is where we have uh, a lot of money available. So we cannot ask for more money than we have. Uh, we can just ask, let's say, to have uh, synergies uh, and the ease uh, to access to, um, uh, to, th to, this, um, uh, to this support. As you said before, uh, for an SME, find a partner. Yeah, it's something that somehow can be a challenge. So uh, wh what we can do is somehow to simplify and uh, ease the access uh, to, this, uh, to this support. Hans, uh, what's uh, your point of view? What are your expectations for policymakers? At the end, uh, my expectations uh, are that we reduce barriers and don't increase them. If we have to react, this is what we heard this, this morning, uh, we have to react pretty much faster, we have to be agile. If you have to be agile and you have to redesign products or whatever in a short time, uh, then useless barriers uh, are hindering that. Um, we have, if, if you look on the on R&D process, uh, developing a product, Developing the product is 50% and the, re and the second 50% is qualification according to all standards invented all over the world. So this is a really a barrier in, in being more agile. And uh, what, what I strongly recommend uh, that reduce the barriers where really needed. We need safety regulations for, for, for sure, uh, but we have tremendous amount of things to fulfill where really useless. And this is what I said, if you really want to to stabilize the supply chains uh, and, and uh, to make the, the companies uh, more, more um, resilient, then we have to reduce the regulations on the lowest level possible and not inventing each day five new regulations. What do you think on that? <laughs> I think it's a fair comment. And it's good that the companies criticize us. We call this better regulation. Uh, because I think when it comes to legislation, which is not my field directly, of course. Uh, yes, the Commission proposes, and then you have many member states coming in, and they have all sorts of good ideas. So we have sometimes the scenario, you go in with one page into legislative negotiations, and you go out with four pages, uh, because everybody wants to find his way. But it's a fair comment, and better regulations, this is a mechanism where also the company should feed in and make the cost argument, because it's a valid argument. Yeah? in particular for SMEs. Um, absolutely happy to take this criticism and also to get examples in this regard. Because under the Green Deal, I'm pretty sure there's a lot to come. <laughs> and it will require another way maybe to look at the cost for companies as well. Well, we have received another question for all of you. So uh, what's the biggest challenge going forward? Maybe we can start with you. To be self-confident, I would say. Uh, we speak a lot about globalization or deglobalization. Um, maybe one remark, no one has mentioned it so far. Um, why, for instance, does the European Union sit at the table of the G7, the G20? Because of human rights? Because of the Green Deal? No, because of a single market which is bigger than the United States. Huh? That's why we sit there. So don't forget the single market. This is actually one of our strengths. And if you see the current discussions on the energy, the energy supply crisis, we have this debate no longer at national level, but at European level, because we have a single market. And everybody has a feeling we need to have a fair share uh, and not to start thinking everybody can do it in their own corner. So self-confident, rely more on the single market, 
It's tough times, but I think we have chances to get, it, to get there. Francesco? I think that the biggest challenge uh, is uh, a change management challenge, uh, because uh, I think that we have to shift from the idea of uh, changing because of a reaction of external turmoils uh, to a change uh, as a state of mind for the companies. So we don't have to create, let's say, just resilient, but flexible uh, supply chain, and also our idea on how to approach them should become flexible. So what we are doing today should not be just tactical uh, action, but should be somehow uh, strategic. So, so looking uh, also to the five, 10 years and also creating uh, all um, uh, the enablers uh, in order to, let's say, survive uh, or to attack the market in the, in, the, in the next five to 10 years. So not just, let's say, looking to the, to the uh, next six months uh, uh, on uh, uh, working on the energy crisis uh, in order to reshape, um, uh, to reshape uh, the organization. Hans, what's the biggest challenge in this moment? Ah. We spoke about a lot of challenges with the, I call it, new way of globalization, um, and therefore we have to do a lot of things, but we have to do these new things with less people. So the biggest challenge, in my opinion, is the demographic issue. Less people have to do more things, and now we are in a, in a period of time where we have to reinvent a lot of new things, the way how we design our products, how we produce and how we organize supply chains. Uh, and so. Clear answer, the biggest challenge is the demographic issue. There is a lot of things to do, and we have to do this with fewer people as before. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Jürgen Tiedje. Thank you, Hans Krattenmacher. Thank you, Francesco Lecis. Thank you for this discussion and also for your questions. Thank you. Thank you.